anatomical considerations for mix. First, I want to talk about optic nerve damage. That's an anatomic consideration. Open or closed angle glaucoma, surface disease and prior surgery, the inability to use drops, and the lens status. Damage. Interestingly, a larger pressure reduction can be achieved in more severe glaucoma. We created a visual field index uh, that basically captures uh, different important clinical components, visual fields, the preoperative medications used, and the preoperative intraocular pressure. The rationale was here that the severity is a clinical index that um, expresses the challenge for a particular eye to treat. If you need more medications, it's a more treatment resistant glaucoma. Um, if the preoperative pressure is higher, then um, that also indicates a more urgent or more severe problem or severe disease of the, of the output system. And finally, the visual field. An advanced visual field um, creates um, a dilemma. Um, it both suggests that treatment probably has to be urgent if the pressure is high, but uh, it can also mean that the optic nerve is more susceptible than um, a not so severely damaged optic nerve. What you can see here now is approximately 200 patients in uh, most groups. Um, with the severe group has a larger pressure reduction compared to the uh, ocular hypertensive patients who had a smaller pressure reduction. This was sustained over time. In other words, um, patients with a high pressure, this is, IOP, this is the IOP by glaucoma severity index, patients with a high uh, intraocular pressure who had severe glaucoma, meaning they had a bad visual field and they were taking many medications, had actually a relatively um, similar post-operative pressure day one uh, it's very similar to the um, moderately severe, not so severe, and the more or less ocular hypertensive patients. And uh, this was sustained for the um, time of the study of about 12 months. The same can be seen with medications, although it is not as impressive. Um, the most severe group in red here has a larger medication drop compared to the ocular hypertensive patients um, represented here by the green line. So slightly higher medication reduction compared to a not so high medication reduction. But there is a problem. So basically the two prior slides imply that you can simply do an app internal trabeculectomy, removing the trabecular meshwork um, as a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery or microincisional glaucoma surgery at any stage of the disease um, because they all drop to the same level. That is true, but you can also see that the standard deviation is much larger. Some patients had a, an enormous um, pressure reduction. But um, there are also uh, patients who will fail and, and not achieve the reduction. In fact, you can see some had an, an, actually a higher pressure, as indicated by the negative reduction, than before. That's, of course, a disaster for these patients, and those need to be moved to a secondary surgery quickly. In fact, um, it really isn't quite as rosy as the averages often seem to imply because we as humans are individuals and some individuals fare well while others don't in glaucoma. Um, just as a reminder, the app internal trabeculectomy with a trabectum removes the trabecular meshwork. So you would expect that the pressure in the anterior chamber 
uh, through these connected pipe systems uh, connected to the episcleral veins, that that should really be then equal to the episcleral veins because it's an open communication. Well, that turns out to be absolutely not the case. You can see that there's literally only one patient here uh, out of 300 who has the predicted pressure of eight, predicted in the sense that you would expect it to be the same as in the episcleral veins, and that just never happens. In fact, if you look at the baseline IOP, you can see that a higher intraocular pressure is associated with a, a higher post-ablation IOP at one month prior to starting medications. In other words, these are, at this point, um, well, you can't call them treatment na naive because they have been treated before, but at one month, certainly most intraocular um, medications uh, are washed out. Most drops will not be uh, reducing it with humor anymore. Uh, and, and yet these patients um, have higher pressures uh, with the, the ones that have a higher preoperative pressure have a higher postoperative pressure. And that is reflected in the app internal trabeculectomy survival plot. You can see that the high success rate of 90% can be seen in the uh, group of ocular hypertensis, and the uh, highest failure rate of about 30% is found in the most severely affected group. Kind of a no-brainer, but you would probably hope, based on these bar graphs that I had shown you, that the more severe group could be just as safely treated as the um, ocular hypertensis. Um, and there's more to that. Not only do the um, patients with a higher pressure not achieve such a good average pressure. I mean, they basically achieve the same average pressure, uh, but that might not be enough in severe glaucoma. If you have a postoperative pressure of about 15, that is a, a normal average eye pressure of a healthy eye, but um, that probably needs to be lower in a, a diseased eye. And this is what this graph shows you. Um, the progression of vision function loss uh, in glaucoma is here sort of graphed out, sketched out as a blue line. Um, it does accelerate. I will show you this in the graph on the right in a second, but um, just take a look at the green curve. Basically, and one has to intervene earlier on in the course of a disease to prevent disability later in life. If, let's say, a trabeculectomy is done once the visual function has already degraded significantly, very little is gained. The patient is made to suffer, has a really bad visual field, and will rapidly continue to lose vision. Um, if you follow this red line. Uh, does this, uh, is this actually true? Because this is just a scheme. Yes, of course it is true. Um, here you can see the um, OCT inferior retinal nerve fiber layer where damage occurs typically early on, and that correlates to superior visual field, uh, a decibel loss. Um, so if you lose a certain amount of retinal nerve fiber layer, nothing really will happen in the visual field. Um, it's quite remarkable how much can get lost, but then there's suddenly an inflection point and some patients deteriorate quite rapidly. Uh, what does this mean? Where does it happen? Well, um, an early visual field to damage would be a nasal step. That doesn't really impress anybody. Um, many patients have this, so that would be here. But look how quickly this can deteriorate to a um, almost central island. Uh, of approximately minus 20 um, decibel damage. So intervening here is key early on where the X is probably, uh, and not just wait for a traditional old surgery to be done when basically uh, too much is already lost. Open or closed angle closure consideration doesn't make a difference for app internal trabeculectomy, one of the most mature um, minimal invasive glaucoma surgeries has been around for 17 years, so there is plenty of data. Um, here we analyzed um, roughly um, 
almost 300 patients with a fairly wide open angle. This is a Schaffer grade, larger than three means uh, there's no way this angle will get occluded by angle closure, but smaller than two means that the um, trabecular meshwork is already being touched by the iris root, and of course, um, Schaffer grade one means it's more or less really closed or touched uh, fully. So um, there were a few patients in this group, but if you look at the open circles, which is the open angle, uh, and the higher risk um, closed angles, just doing a trabectome on fake guys reduces pressure reasonably well, and it does so in both open and uh, narrow angle eyes. So there's literally no difference. Uh, that's surprising because you would think you probably have to remove the lens to uh, have more space, um, but turns out this is apparently not the case. Uh, not only that, also the medications are basically uh, indistinguishable in these two groups, just doing a trabectome, not removing the cataract in an eye with a narrow angle. If you do remove the cataract, um, that's a common practice for full, acute, or chronic angle closure. This is probably cataract surgery is one of the main things uh, that is done in Asia because it's so common to deepen the angle. In addition to that, people do glaucoma surgeries, not necessarily the trabectome, but just trabeculectomies. There are um, a couple of studies, uh, but one can do the trabectome. Uh, the epiderm trabeculectomy um, quite well and open the angle again and, and again. There is no difference in the narrow angle and the open angle in those two groups. Same with the medications. That um, to us was a surprise. The question is, how could that possibly be? Um, well, um, when you see the surgery, you can notice that by releasing or removing the meshwork, the scleral spur already drops posterior, thereby probably creating a larger uh, opening and reducing the risk of um, infusions in the periphery, peripheral anterior synechiae, um, the medical term for that. Surface disease and prior surgery. There's a case with Sjögren syndrome and steroid-induced glaucoma. Sjögren is um, an autoimmune disease that causes severe uh, ocular dryness, severe dry mouth. Um, here we were treating a 73-year-old Caucasian. Pressure was 35 millimeter on three different drops. Um, she had severe Sjögren syndrome with severe dry eye disease, filamentary keratitis. It looks like a little spaghetti hanging off the cornea, uh, not just at the rim, but in the center and, and literally everywhere in the cornea. Very unpleasant, painful, uh, makes your life miserable. There were erosions on the cornea from this severe dryness, and she also had a very dry mouth, so clearly a pretty bad um, because of this, she was receiving prednisone, a, a potent steroid, not even at such a high dose, four milligram per day, with some potassium replacements and some bone um, bone density loss uh, prevention medication here. Um, when we first saw her, she had full-blown steroid-induced glaucoma, and unfortunately, she had not seen an eye doctor for six months. Her pressure was 50 in both eyes. And, and that basically went unnoticed um, because I guess the primary care doctor didn't quite think of that. And um, it's not such an extreme pressure, it's not that common. Um, her eye exam was as in the following her right eye had a vision of 2050, 2200 in the left, severe so crusting, these filaments. Uh, on the cornea that I described. She had a, a bad cataract in both eyes with a dense posterior plate. That's very typical for steroid use. And she was cupped uh, very severely, very severe inferior uh, rim thinning of the optic nerve uh, and moderate superior thinning. And here in the left eye, this was uh, even more severe corresponding to the visual acuity. For visual field, you can see a large superior nasal step, um, splitting fixation indicating severe glaucoma and sort of a more arcuate damage inferiorly, um, which 
matched her um, OCT more or less. Uh, in the left eye, uh, she looked quite worse, uh, almost to the point where you could call this a central island um, with more severe retinal nerve fiber layer. So we did a, a combined cataract surgery with an epidermal trabeculectomy with a trabectome. Um, in the right eye on day one, she improved quite remarkably to 2025 with a pressure of only 10 off drops. And then uh, post-operative month 12, a whole year after surgery, she was still seeing quite well. Her pressure was still very low and she was not needing any drops. That was phenomenal for this woman. In the left eye, that's the eye that was more severely affected. Also pressure of 10 for about five months. Uh, then the honeymoon was over. At 18 months, the pressure had increased to 40 millimeter mercury, too high for this eye. Not a disaster, but suboptimal. So we added Travitan Z, a prostaglandin with allied preservatives. So conclusions from this case, um, trabectome can be especially powerful when the trabecular meshwork is the primarily affected tissue. As we know, steroids induce myosillin, um, and that basically creates a very obvious outflow resistance at the level of the trabecular meshwork. Um, so that's a good choice when the trabeculectomy is difficult. You would probably have chosen this um, many years ago for this kind of severe um, optic nerve damage, but since the surface was so terrible, any blep forming surgery uh, was a sort of contraindicated because the conjunctival wasn't in a terrible shape. Um, this procedure was relatively easy and effectively combined with phaco emulsification. So it didn't only lower her pressure, it made, made her life more tolerable with uh, regards to drops and pressure, but it also improved her vision. So this is one of the nice things of these minimally invasive surgeries, not just of trabectome surgery in particular, that you can easily and elegantly combine this with vision improvement, not just IOP improvement, which is more or less uh, great for the doctor. Uh, they say, wow, nice pressure, but um, a, you know, a true function improvement that is um, a blessing for the affected. All right, here's the second case, uh, severe angle closure, 81-year-old Caucasian woman. She's deaf and mute. Her pressure was 20 on three drops, even oral diamox, uh, acetosolomide, um, to really shut down aqueous humor production. She also had a so-called decime stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty, an internal uh, horn, uh, cornea transplant, if you will, in the left eye. There were extensive corneal iris adhesions. Uh, the drops were affecting her transplant because this worsens the pump function of the endothel endothelium, and uh, she had a very difficult time adhering to her medications. Um, in the left eye, her pressure, uh, her visual acuity was worse than the right eye. Um, adhesions I described thinning, um, not quite as bad, but definitely worse than. Fortunately, on OCT, she didn't look quite as bad as the numbers had implied here. So we decided to go into this eye here, nasal side, temporal side, surgeon sits here. Um, and um, I opened, the, I basically repealed off the adhesions. Um, and let's see what happens here. By the way, her visual field looked quite good. So uh, that, was, um, that was good to see. Uh, first, hydrodissection of these adhesions, um, nasal. And then um, you can see now how there are peripheral anterior syndicii. Basically, the meshwork is glued shut, but with irrigating aspirating instruments like the trabectome here, you can go in, break these adhesions, get the trabecular meshwork, and remove the trabecular meshwork here. All in one session, this was only topical anesthesia. Yes, the patient, uh, she was not able to communicate during the surgery. She was deaf and mute. She knew what was coming and she kept still and did extremely well. In the left eye at 18 months, she had uh, a vision that had improved 2060 because the cornea had recovered, the pressure was great. She only took Timolol, a beta blocker, in the morning. The conclusions here 
can be a trabeculum can be helpful as a standalone procedure. Topical anesthesia uh, can be used even in difficult patients where you wouldn't necessarily think that that is a good choice. Um, this procedure was gentle on the cornea compared, for instance, to a big tube shunt, and um, one has great view uh, during the gonia syndiculitis because it's an irrigating aspirating instrument. Uh, chamber is stable. What could you? What else could you ask for as a surgeon? Okay, inability to use drops. Another consideration: rheumatoid arthritis. Many patients just can't use drops. They're not physically able to squeeze the bottle. So that is a, an atomic uh, problem uh, where you would say early uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery is um, not just adequate but probably necessary. And this is quite interesting. This is not an anatomic problem as much as it is more a psychological, maybe psychiatric problem. We as humans are terrible in doing what is good for us uh, or following advice. This is pilocarpine as a glaucoma medication. The adherence here sinks and sinks and sinks uh, five months out. When you look at more modern medications, pilocarpine being used four times a day and quite unpleasant to use because it constricts the pupil, you see here prostaglandin analogs. Once a day, you would think this is easy to do. Well, look at this. Only 30% of patients use this drop as instructed as 12 months, and the other drops fare even worse. Um, Friedman did a beautiful analysis, and shockingly, only 10% of these patients in this study had their drops continuously available at 12 months, so worse than this number even. So um, minimal invasive glaucoma surgery can be a blessing for those individuals. Good news here, phaco emulsification does not increase the IOP reduction you get with a trabecular meshwork removal. We used coarse and exact matching um, phacotrabectome to trabectome patients, um, and uh, in the past, especially with eye stents and other bypass stents, um, the impression was that phaco has a huge contribution to the pressure reduction because phaco alone can lower pressure. Not so when you combine this with a trabectome because you open such an enormous amount of um, Schlems canal that there is no effect from phaco. It, phaco is thought to be some sort of terbeculoplasty, uh, basically a modification of the meshwork uh, due to the ultrasound for one. Um, but the red line and the black line are not distinguishable. Same with the medications, both groups are the same. And of course, an exact matching means that the patient pairs that were included here were more or less I, almost identical. Great. Sorry. Um, we talked about optic nerve damage. We said um, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries are okay to try first, even in advanced glaucoma. A higher failure rate, however, can be expected in severe glaucoma. Some patients will have a high resistance that's not at the level of a trabe uh, the trabecular meshwork, that is rather in the distal outflow tract. Open or closed angle glaucoma. Surprisingly, there is no major difference. Um, so one can really do both. Surface disease and other prior surgeries, um, well, they look challenging, but epiternal procedures like trabectome surgery, for instance, can be a remarkably simple solution for very complex eyes. And certainly they don't do any harm, so why not try? Inability to use drops, more common than thought, um, whether they are physical disabilities or just uh, inabilities to adhere to regimens, which is awfully common. Uh, let's do a mix here. Lens status, uh, not terribly important. The good news is one can just focus on the pertinent problem if there is a cataract in the same individual. Let's improve the vision, let's take it out, but if there isn't, um, the lens can stay. In other words, you can operate on young patients who don't yet have a cataract. Uh, none of these analyses and, uh, and work would have been possible without the great individuals in my research group, uh, nor could they have been done without the collaborators I've worked with. And of course, um, one always needs funding. With that, I want to thank you.